Welcome back to The Big Show, talking to the big stars today. And I've got to say, a legend has joined us who I'm a huge fan of. No, don't laugh. You've been doing it for 400 years. Well, that's true. Roy Hudd, how are you? I'm the Anglo-Saxon's favourite comedian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you, Alec. I mean, you've done so much and you've worked with so many people. Yeah. Let's start with who you've enjoyed working with the most. Well, there's a lot of... I mean, I did enjoy my last sort of thing that I did in as part of a company. You know, I enjoyed nearly all the pantos I did because uh, I was allowed to write them and direct them. And then you choose your own company, you see. So you know you're going to have a good time. But I suddenly got catapulted last year into doing The Merry Widow. I mean, it sounds, <laughs> sounds like a Max Miller joke, doesn't it? Because Max <laughs> used to say, I'm doing The Merry Widow next week. And if it goes well, you know, I may surprise all my fans and do the chocolate soldier i don't know <laughs> <laughs> they asked me to go and do this very widow you see and i said well you know i'd quite like it with the eno you know the london coliseum and i thought all these snotty opera singers and opera chorus and all that and we had an absolute ball it was marvelous with i think perhaps the greatest tenor in this country young tenor chap called alfie bow you know who's absolutely brilliant and all the sort of comedy parts they were terrific singers and everything but they were great fun and we had a ball we really did and I've got on my desk at home I've got a, a certificate that says I was made non member of the chorus of the, of the <laughs> ENO signed by the musical director and everything so it was great though I, I love working in a company in fact I've always enjoyed working in a company much more than I have doing a, a solo turn I started as a double act and when you go on on your own, there's no one to blame if it goes wrong. At least if there's two, or, just at least two of you, you can come off and have a go at it. Can't you? But and worship when you're in a company, of course, you have a go at everybody in sight. It's never your fault, is it? But when you're on your own, it's uh, it's tough. And I, I didn't like uh, touring the clubs and that on my own. You know, it was so. In the end, I put some songs and I got a pianist. At least it was someone to have a go at. You know? <laughs> what I love about you is you still seem thrilled to be in. The- the business you've always yeah. seemed excited to entertain an audience and you enjoy being funny yeah those traits don't seem to be around much these days do they well, they don't people do take it all terribly seriously they really do um i mean for 26 years i did the on radio i did the news headlines which was a topical uh, you know um comedy show with jim whitfield and chris emmett and uh, it, that really did have a go at everybody. You know, now, when you see comedy, a lot of the comedy today, they're having a go at people, but it's not very funny. Now, I only had one yardstick on the, on the headlines when new writers used to come along. I used to say, you can make all the points you, you like and you can knock anybody. It makes no difference to me, but it must make people laugh. And it's going back to my hero of all time, you know, Charles Dickens, who said, if I can entertain, they'll listen to what I'm saying. Yep. But if I'm just giving them the boring facts, they're not <laughs> going to, you know. And that's how I sort of uh, thought about that. Today, so many of the uh, comics, you know, they're real, they're more politicians than comics. And I think that's a shame. And still, when you talk to people, young people, old people, whatever, always they quote, they'll quote everyone from Laurel and Hardy to Tommy Cooper to Eric and Ernie, all the people who were just funny we used to say terrible things about people we didn't approve of but there was always hopefully a laugh at the end of it and that is so important you must always keep that sense of fun about it because don't take it that seriously it's all happened before and it'll all happen again why do you think comedians work so well on the radio because the two go hand yeah, in hand don't they they do i mean i loved working in radio because you can go off the point and you know we used to have lib and busk around particularly me and chris and uh, it was marvellous because you could, it's so easy to edit, you know. And if you hit the right button, the two of you, and Chris and I were very good together with the, the buskin and the ad libbing, and it was great. And June Whitfield was in control, you know, because she'd say, she'd let us go. And when she thought the audience were getting bored, she'd say, <laughs> yes, but more to the point, she'd say, and bring us back to the script. But I think radio is so easy to edit, funny enough. That's the great thing about radio. And of course, the great thing about radio as well is they allow you to have an audience, mm. you know, which is terrific at working at the, well, first of all, the Paris studio down here, and then the radio theatre. And it's like playing a proper show with an audience that's very close to you. And I mean, every comic worth their sort, they must have an audience. 
months, you know. I did the uh, I did the Coronation Street for a couple of years, uh, playing The Undertaker, you know. And uh, they said, would I stay, you see? And I said, well, I don't think I can, I can't bear it without an audience. And they said, well, if you stay, you've got to, nothing else, you can't do anything else. I said, oh, no, no, I couldn't do that. I mean, I couldn't survive if I didn't get in front mm. of an audience and got a bit of reaction. You're just a big old show off, aren't you? Really? Well, there's your answer. It's like you've got it in one. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing with, uh, with uh, without an audience, you have to wait until it goes on telly. <laughs> and then you go into the pub and then they say, that was terrible last night. <laughs> well, that was good last night. But at least with an audience, you get an instant decision decision you know a laugh or a raspberry you know you've got to, <laughs> but it's immediate you must be quite annoyed with june whitfield and you must have fallen I'm always out with annoyed her. with june whitfield well she's forget? competing with you now with an autobiography isn't she this well year? it's no she did an autobiography a few years ago this is a smashing book she's got out now june and it's all photographs and if you like photographs and you know so the sun readers will be there for that one because uh, <laughs> they don't have to make their lips move as they're reading you know so <laughs> no it's a terrific book and but mine is an autobiography june did hers about five or six years ago i think you know so it's a, it really is a joy of a book to look through there aren't that many naturally funny women are there was she always exceptional I think she was, you know, I think she was. I mean, point one, she's a marvellous actress. That's point one. And funny ladies are usually marvellous actresses. They really are. You know, I loved Joyce Grenfell as an actress. She was marvellous. June is terrific. And when she's played a few straight parts, you know, she's absolutely brilliant. But people won't let her do it because they know that when June walks on, people are going to start smiling. Mm. And you're halfway there. I mean, it was a triumph wasn't it her playing jennifer saunders mum in ab fab it really was <laughs> well we did that particular year when she was playing it we got to the end of the year and we're quite big buddies june she only lives just fairly near us and we were comparing and i said you realize that you and i june got the two biggest laughs on television that entire year now one was june in ab fab when she put the condoms on the finger and said you know <laughs> these washing up gloves are not not like they used to be made, <laughs> which was a woofer. And the other one was I did a, an episode of um, uh, One Foot in the Grave, you know, who, written, of course, by David Rennick, who was one of our writers on Huntlines. And, and I was this huge bloke. They made me up to pad me up to about 40 <laughs> stone. And I lived next door to, to what's his name, the old boy. So they, he, they had to look after me. And I sat in their house while my daughter, you know, went to the, the doctors or whatever it was. Was, and I couldn't move. I was so huge, you know. And she said, "Now, um, she said, now don't worry. You'll be perfectly all right." And uh, he said, uh, "Toilet." And she said, "Oh yes." She said, "It's just." And they said, "No, I've, I've just been to the toilet." <laughs> it was honestly Alan, it was the two biggest laughs on television that year and I said June we've cracked it Roy what are you I'm confused I mean are you an entertainer a comedian an actor a singer a performer what are you well the thing is I'm hopefully always in work that's actually what I <laughs> yeah. don't remember do you, you still worry about that even now oh yeah you always do you know because it's like people say to me you know uh, when are you going to retire I say when they stop asking me you know <laughs> and when they don't ask you start getting very shaky you really do I mean writing this autobiography was it was worthwhile me giving up work for three months you know because I said if I'm going to I've written books before but they're all sort of anecdotal books and little history of various performers and stuff like that. You can do that in between entrances in a play, <laughs> but you can't write... Well, I couldn't write a bio, an autobiography like in that particular way. I had to sit down and really clear my brain and go back to the beginning, what I remembered. So it was, it was worth doing. It was worth doing for three months, and it was an absolute labour of love. It really was, you know. And uh, I had really not a lot of help because I should have kept... We all should keep diaries, you see. Mm. But we never do, you know. You keep diaries when you're very young, you know. Then as soon as you discover girls, you know, that's the end. You don't keep the diaries. It's the only diaries you keep are with special asterisks that mean certain rude things, you know. But there's nothing else. And the only thing I did keep, which was a good 
good record was I'd kept a copy of every contract I'd ever signed and I'd just put them in a box in my office. So that was terrific, going through that and you suddenly saw a name there, you know. Golly, I remember that. And it all sort of came flooding back to you. But I did look at, I had some very early diaries and my favourite diary entry in one of them, which is putting your priorities right, you know. And it said, today at assembly... Uh, it was announced that King George VI had died in his sleep, full stop. I cleaned out my mice. <laughs> that was the next line. <laughs> so that's what you think of when, you, when you're about 11 or 12. <laughs> but it was, I wish I'd kept a diary, and I think everyone should if they can keep a diary. I mean, Simon Brett, who was, funny enough, radio producer, was our first guy who thought of the news headlines. And he's a great expert on diaries and all that. And some of the diaries he's discovered are marvellous, you know. And my granddaughter was the inspiration for me writing this book because she said, she's about 12 now, and she said, Grandad, you've got to, you know, you've got to write all these stories down, Grandad, because I shall forget them. So that was good. No better it? reason, is it? So I said, OK, I'll do it. Then they offered me money and I did it even quicker. Roy, yeah. um, I've, I've lost my piece of paper. What's the book called? Uh, it's called, what a good lad you are. It's called A Fart in a Calendar. And I'll tell you <laughs> where it came from. It was my gran who brought me up, you see. And I can remember the first time I ever heard her use that word. And it was, we were, she brought me up and one of my aunties was down there and said, don't you ever sit still, mum? And she <laughs> She said, no, he's like a fart in a calendar, she said. <laughs> and so it became a running gag in the family, you see. Oh. And it was quite fun. I've got to tell you, it's quite funny. I did that breakfast television, you see. Mm. And we got there and they put a, a blow up behind me of the front cover of the book. And they'd airbrushed out the title. <sighs> I kid you not. And they said, the bloke <laughs> ran down, he said, don't let him say the title of the book. He said to the boy who was on the couch, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the girl, Sean, there, she got on the phone and said, what are you talking about? It's ridiculous. Anyway, this boy said about halfway through the interview, he said, well, I've done my best to avoid you giving the title of the of the book, but you <laughs> mentioned it four times. I said, sorry, five. A fart in a calendar. <laughs> but it was so interesting, Alex, because they said, now, my other grand's favourite phrase was, when she saw a comedian, who she really liked and now don't forget she took me just after the war so the the young comics coming up were the Frankie Howards and Max Bygraves and people like that Peter Sellers and all this so she, or when one really made her laugh she'd say he's a silly b you see that was it now this guy <laughs> on the breakfast television said don't let him say b can say b he said but no b and then I did another one uh, Alan Titchmar show and the director phoned down he said he can say b not b <laughs> I mean, I ask you, isn't it ludicrous? <laughs> my granddaughter said, my missus said to her, they wouldn't let your dad give the title, or your granddad give the title of the book. And she said, why? <laughs> she said, it's not a swear word, she said. Oh, it does make you laugh. I mean, they've gone over the top after this Jonathan Rosson thing and that. But I mean, they, him and the other fella did say rather worse things than that. Well, do you know what's going to be interesting is, of course, 17 people will have to listen to this interview before it goes out. Yeah. Whether oh, yes, they make it'll be it. Won't it be? That will be so good. I'm going to phone it? you and let you know. What yeah, they, please do, Alex. I'd, I'd love to know. I won't second guess it. You'd never guess. No. Because they could either let it go or that whole last <laughs> section that the listeners will be wondering, what did they say could be bleeped? Well, it was lovely. I did uh, what's it you know the other day Woman's Hour oh, and, and Jenny Murray you know it's quite <laughs> scary really but I quite like her because yeah. she's a face <laughs> she looks exactly like my missus her facially she's a little bit bigger than my missus but facially mm. she's got a lovely face so I always love talking to Jenny and that and she made me give the title and everything but I don't think they wanted her to but she made me give it and the funny thing is we had the launch of it last night the book and a few friends came in and a few old girls have been fans for years you know they say we're not going in the shops for and saying I want to find a calendar what's it all about and I said well go in and just say I want his book you know they wouldn't say it well well done on that it's, it, you do win the award for best title of a book this year absolutely <laughs> thank you it's, it is quite amazing the reaction it's got that title you know it wasn't my idea because I, we were talking about the book and talking about my gran who was the hero of my life and brought 
me up and it was my missus's idea she said you ought to call it a fart to come in I said the old girls will never stand for that she said oh but the kids would Absolutely. it'll make them look at it she said I want to go through a few other things in our remaining moments and the yeah. comedians you've worked with firstly are most comedians a bit odd Yes, they are. I mean, I always think it's sad in a way. I mean, it, it hasn't really happened to me, I promise, I promise you. But they usually, whoever gives out these gifts, they give it with one hand and take it away with another, you know. They're either and very funny, they're very funny, but then they're either, they don't, they're worried sexually about things, they drink, or they're onto drugs, or there's some terrible hang-ups in their lives, and whoever gives these gifts out, whether they give them with one hand mm. and take them away with another, I do not know. Um, I've known quite a few comics over the years, and most of them are not very happy people. They've always got a load of problems and you know a load of things on their, on their uh, in their nuts. But the ones I have met that were jolly were terrific, you know. And I tell you, it was a marvelous company was Eric Morecambe, mm. and he was just like he was on the box all the time, you know. Other comics are not like Tommy Cooper was the same. You couldn't see a join. You could not see a join. And the great story of of Cooper was at one stage just after he died, you'd talk to cab drivers, and they always say. Here, I had that Tommy Cooper in here, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and uh, all of them told the same gag, they said, as he got out with a tea bag, have a drink on me. You know? <laughs> but, and the only one I got anything like that was I was playing Fagin in Oliver at the Albury Theatre, you know. And I'm in this cab, and there was one of those conversion tables stuck on the on the back, you know, where the driver is, where they whatever was shown on the on the clock, you had to add some money to it, you see. And I never noticed that and I was late. So I get to the Albury Theatre and I give the geezer the money and I thought about 50 pence tip or something. And then I, as I'm getting out, I saw the conversion table and it was about a quid short, you know. But as I was getting out, he said, here, Roy, I said, what? He said, if you play Fagin as well in there, I'm coming in to see you tonight <laughs> as you do in my cab. Yeah. <laughs> so that was it. And the other one, I'm sure people have had it as well, but it was my favourite. That was a cab driver and he said, just a minute. And it was when I was doing the radio. He said, I recognise that voice. Go oh, blimey, he says, Roy Hard, isn't it? I said, yeah. He said, blimey, he said, Roy Hard. He said, I can't believe it. He said, well, I'll get home and tell my missus. I said, oh, is she a fan? He said, she thinks you're rubbish. He <laughs> said, <laughs> Fair enough. So I just give him a tip. <laughs> the public never lie, though, do they? They're, no, they they're, they're really honest. We were talking yesterday <laughs> at, the, at the launch of the book. Barry Cryer came, you know, as an old buddy. And he said, he's in a cab, this, and uh, the cab driver said, here, while you're there, Baz, he said, uh, sign us an autograph, will you? And he said, I said, certainly. He said, oh, you didn't think I was serious, did you? I'm only kidding. He said, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's all good clean fun who was the one that impressed you the most and the one that you were so thrilled to work with that you'll remember and take to your grave with you well I think it's probably someone that a lot of people wouldn't know but I did do about 15 pantos with a comedian called Jack Tripp and Jack was the greatest dame you know and I just I discovered Jack I was put into a show and he was there and we hit it off like a dream and we worked on all those panthers together. We worked out lots of routines, things. He was just fantastic to work with. Now, as a performer, I always, the ones I admire most is when you're playing opposite, be it an actor, be it a comic or anything, but you look into their eyes and you see the truth when you're playing. Uh, Sue Nichols, who I played opposite with in the street, exactly that when you looked into her eyes you got the truth makes you better now jack was a a dancer comedian and the best dame in the country and when you were playing scenes with him in the pantomime mm. you'd look into his eyes and you'd see the truth and i used to believe he was my mother you know really <laughs> it is amazing you know and he'd been the mother to frank bruno and all sorts of people you know? but he uh, that was i think jack was the most a uh, person who impressed me most because we devised lots of comedy. And w when we were working on stage and a laugh happened, he would say something. That would extend it. And I would say something. And before you knew where you were, the other chap, of course, who was huge, I was a huge fan of and died far, far too young, was Billy Dainty, you know, the eccentric dancer. And Billy and I, I, I wrote a show about two old performers, two old songwriters called Weston and Lee. And... Uh, 
Billy and I played Weston and Lee. And we used to, these guys were the guys who wrote Goodbye, When Father Papered the Part, you name it. Every musical song, they wrote practically every song, you know, What a Lovely War, you know, all those years. But they wrote it as contemporaries when the First World War was on, you know. But Billy was just tremendous. And we did a thing. I found a record in the BBC libraries here that these two guys, Weston and Lee, had written. And it was just a 78, but it was like a takeoff of variety, of a variety show. Mm. And it, it featured little parodies of all funny, famous comedians and that. Like one was, here he is, Carry Champion. Yes, for you know where you from, <laughs> you know, and all this. And one was Arthur Jensen Prim, who was a ventriloquist. <laughs> and what are you going to sing for me tonight, little man? He said, I'm going to sing where the gizzy gungle geese are gizzy guzzing. <laughs> So I told Bill about I told Billy about this. We were in the middle of the show, and uh, he said we ought to do it. He said because they were the guys who wrote for everybody. He said you can be the dummy and I'll be the vent. You see, <laughs> so that was the idea, and we just sang this song at the end. Well, we uh, so much happened. We developed so much business. It was two and a half minutes when we started. By the time we finished the tour, it was nearly twenty minutes long. This routine, <laughs> and all the cast used to come down and watch it because you. <laughs> never knew what he was going to do or what I was going to do. It was, that's the joy of, of comedy. And it's the sad thing today because you normally only do a thing once for radio or television. You cannot develop it. Mm. And people say, why don't we see another Hancock? Why don't we see another Rob Wilton? All these people. Because they had time to develop their routines, add bits, take bits out. When stuff died, they'd give it the elbow. When it went like a bomb, they'd extend it. Someone did an ad lib one night, they'd keep it in. It was, it was a process. You had to go through that process, I think, to get an immaculate mm. piece of comedy. You cannot do it as a one-off. I mean, the time all of us have sat there and said, someone's given us a gag and we've said, oh, and we can't go wrong and you go on that doesn't get a tit <laughs> and another thing you say yeah well it's only a throwaway and I'll try it round of applause mm. you cannot tell you have to do it the acid test is in front of an audience congratulations on being you it's such a thrill to meet you and you are a true legend this book celebrates 50 years in show business and it really is a, a true insight into the best years really of show business because I think now it's not so much show business as a business I'm afraid so, you know. And it's not as much fun as it was in certain ways because you don't work with lots of other comedians. As a comedian, usually you're the only one that's employed that mm. night. Whereas in the days of variety, when you had jugglers, you had singers, you had always two or three comics on the bill, you got to know people. You were a week in each town. You spent the daytime before we went to the theatre causing trouble. You know. <laughs> there was a wonderful... He's just died sadly... The be I think probably, apart from Arthur Worsley, the best ventriloquist I've ever seen, who was a man called Neville King. I don't know if you ever saw Neville, <laughs> but he used to have a terrible old granddad that was in a terrible state, and he used to get upset with the audience, and, it <laughs> and he was so offbeat. Uh, Neville and he really could throw his voice I mean it was great to go out with him on a bus <laughs> it really was because there were dogs barking there were sheep at the other end of the bus he did all these things that he did I always remember we, we were, the last time I saw Neville and he used to do a routine and all his dummies were ugly terribly ugly and he had a cat that had a bit of touch of mange and all this you know, horrible face and everything and he had a big tea chest on stage and he threw this cat because it annoyed him into this tea chest and how they worked it but loads of feathers came out of this tea <laughs> chest and all this and he reached inside got out a ball you know pigeon threw it back in <laughs> then he reached in and got got a snake got a great big snake out and it was moving and making noises and everything <laughs> and he beat it to death on the stage the snake and in the middle of beating it to death he looked at the audience and said you won't forget me for your Christmas your children's party <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he's a genius, this bloke. He is a genius. But they were the great things of variety. You used to see people like that in variety. Mm. Now, you see, we were talking about, uh, you know, about farting a calendar and silly bugger. Now, you'd never get away with that on television, beating a, a snake to death. And <laughs> you'd have the RSPCA on the phone. That's right. You? That's right. You see, and it is so dumb. Really. Well, very finally, before we go, Roy, what do you want people to say about you after you're gone? Because you've given so many uh, comments about other comedians. Yeah. What do you hope they say about you? Well, I think they. Ju- I just hope they say he was a jolly sort of chap, and uh, and he did provide a lot of laughs for people. I mean, it is the greatest, uh, the greatest uh, kudos you can have is to be allowed that to try and make people laugh, you know. And I know that I've made people laugh over the years because I've got letters to prove it, you know, mostly from the wife. But I, <laughs> I would just like people to say, he did make me laugh. That's all you want, you know. They're not going to make one of those dreadful documentaries about you in about 10 years' time and, and come out with all your seedy past, Oh, they? no, no, there isn't much <laughs> of it sad to say, you know. I mean, I wrote into a thing the other day and I said... Sadly, not in this book, sadly, not very much sex. I said, hardly any scandal, no drugs, but hopefully a lot of laughs. <laughs> what a great legacy that is. Uh, it's in your stores now. It's called A Fart in a Colander, or as our editors may make it, A Bleep in a Bleep. <laughs> uh, well, you no, calendar's <laughs> all right. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Uh, Roy Hudd is a big star and thank you so much for talking to me it's a true honour and a pleasure and the new book which we can't mention uh, is out now thank you <laughs> thanks a lot <laughs> bleep in a bleep Colin you know it's terribly rude <laughs>